Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 224. We are just blessed the month of Elul. And this year, Rosh Chodesh Elul, which is always two days, is on Shabbos and Sunday. So it's a special kfiyas, it doesn't happen that often. So obviously we'll begin talking about that. We are uh, living with the times, which is the weekly parsha, and that is the parsha of Re'e. So this coming Shabbos will be Re'ei, be Rosh El. We take out a second Sefer Tera, and we read connected to Rosh Chodesh and Haftera, even though the Haftera's Shiva de Nechemta should be the third week of the Constellation, we read actually Hashemayim Kisi. There are different customs around this, but we read Hashemayim Kisi, the Haftera of Rosh Chodesh, and also Haftera of Mocha Chodesh, because since Rosh Chodesh is also the second day on Sunday, so so we read the first verses from that Tafteira. That still does not mean that we're not experiencing Shivda Nechemta, as the Rebbe says, Shivda Nechemta, let me just explain, are the seven weeks that follow the three weeks of the saddest part, part of the calendar, so the weeks of consolation. So each week we read a Tafteira about consolation, about Nechama, Shabbos Nachmu, then came last week's chapter, and now Re'ei will be the third. But because of Resh Chedesh, so even though we technically don't read that Avteda, but the, still the effect of the, of the third week of constellation obviously remains with us. And we'll talk about that as well as we began last week in a series of each week as the Chassidus applied of understanding the significance of the Avteda and the significance of its relevance application to our personal lives. So, what's the connection between all these things? So let's start with the Rish Chedesh El itself. Rish Chedesh El, as the Rebbe always emphasizes, Rish Chedesh, Rish, it's not called Tchilas HaChedesh, not the beginning of the month, but the head of the month. The head, like a central nervous system, is not just the beginning of the month, it also controls all the days of the month. Like a head controls, the central nervous system controls the entire body. So besides being the beginning of the month, it also is a uh, the head. In this case, there's a unique thing with Rish Chedesh El, Obviously, it's the Rish Chedesh of the last month of the year, which is the month that's called Cheshbon, Chedesh HaCheshbon, the month of accounting, where we take and make an accounting for the past year, and Chedesh HaAchana, the month of preparation for the new year. So Rish Chedesh, in a sense, encompasses that entire accountability and entire preparation. Additionally, on the day of Rish Chedesh El, there are different opinions, whether it was the first day, which would have been Shabbos, which would be Shabbos or Sunday. The second day of Rish Chedesh, which is technically the first day of El, is actually Sunday. The 30th day of Av is the first day of Rish Chedesh. So, the two opinions, but either way, Moshe Rabbeinu went up on the Mount Sinai for the third time. We know that he received the Torah on Shavuos, which is Vav, Zion, Sivan, and then... Uh, 40 days later, he came down. Unfortunately, the Jews had built the golden calf. Moshe shattered the Luchas. That's the 17th of Tammuz. He went back up and stayed praying for the Jews for forgiveness till 30 days, 40 days later is, is the Rosh Chedesh El. Came down, was not successful yet, and then went up a third time and would remain now in the mountain from Rosh Chedesh El, from the beginning of El, through the whole El, Rosh Hashanah, all the way through Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur would be the 40th day from the beginning of Elul, 30 days of Elul, and 10 days, Yom Kippur is the 10th of Tishrei, is the day when he, Salachti Kidvarecha, God said, I forgive, I forgive them as you've spoken. So he achieves in the, the ultimate forgiveness and reconciliation and comes down with the second tablets. So Rosh is besides the significance of every Rosh has that power, the power of reconciliation, the power of tshuva the power of return, the power of being able to repair after something is broken. I think it doesn't need much explanation, the lesson to each of us. None of us are perfect. But relationships and trust is not built on perfection, it's built on accountability. Accountability. Saying, I am sorry. Saying, I acknowledge I did something wrong. So the problem is not making a mistake. We have to avoid mistakes as much as possible. But what do we do afterwards? The cover-up. The lie that covers up the initial mistake is often worse than the original mistake. So El teaches us the importance of acknowledgement, awareness, accountability. The 
first step toward all types of relationships, the first step toward integrity, toward trust. So, of course, this is between us and God, but also between man and man, between one human being and another. In the context of Chassidus applied, they, they have hope. There's always hope. There's no such thing as broken, bro- damaged goods, and that it's broken, it can't be fixed. If it could be broken, it could be repaired. And El teaches us this. And the Shredish El is the beginning of the month, is the power all generates from the Shredish. Obviously, now it has to be unpacked and unfolded and expressed and developed throughout the month. But it begins in the Shredish El. That's the power of El. El itself has many meanings. And we'll talk about them throughout this month. Uh, and uh, But right now, the focus here is being that we're just blessed the new month and it's a Shredish. It's Shabbos. What's the connection with Shabbos? What makes it unique? So in various sikhs, the Rebbe explains the connection between Chedesh and Shabbos. Seemingly are actually two opposites. Because Chedesh is defined by the moon. The lunar cycles. That's what defines a new moon. That's a new month, a new month of El. What defines Shabbos is the cycles of the sun. Daily, day and night. Seven days of the week. It's the solar cycle. And when they come together, you have the solar and the lunar joining what is the significance of that? So Chassidus explains the lunar is the Kayach HaMakabal, Eid HaMakabal. That's called the energy of receiving. That also requires energy. And receiving is not just a passive state. When a student is a Kali, a Kabbalah, he becomes receptive to absorb, that takes work. Because he's putting himself aside to absorb something greater than himself. That's the moon. It absorbs the light of the sun and reflects it. And the sun is Eid HaMashpia, the energy of giving, of generating. We each need both. We need to be generators and we need to be absorbers. So usually these are two separate Avedas. They don't come together necessarily. But here, when they come together, Shabbos, Shredish, it emphasizes the confluence and the joining and the fusion of these two forces. But one is, one is receiving, one is giving. How can you do both together? Because a true recipient is... The one that know, a true giver is someone that knows how to be a true recipient. And a true recipient causes him to be a true giver or her. So it's not just two separate forces here. When you're able to receive well, then you're able to give well. If you never received it properly, how can you really transmit it properly? So there's times when we have to emphasize that focus, that you need to have both the bitl ha which is the, the selflessness and the suspension of self in order to receive something greater than yourself, the moon, and that's Rosh Chodesh, and the Shabbos, the element of hashpa of transmission. And we see, the moon is not just absorbing, it gives off light too. And it gives off a light that in many ways is more powerful than the sunlight. Not in, in, in sheer uh, firepower, in quantity, but in quality. And that's why the Jewish people are compared to the moon. And the moon reflects Malchus, and it's all the powers of Malchus. So on one hand, it doesn't have anything of its own, but what it, when it receives, it creates something that the Zah, Zah, which is the Midas, this explains the sun, Hashpa energy, the energy of generating, the energy of transmitting, does not have quite that power. And that's why you see, Mitamide Yesu Mekula. When the teacher was asked, where did you learn most? He said, I learned much from my teachers. I learned more from my colleagues. Umetamide and for my students, yes and makulam, I learn more than all. How is that possible? Students are less, no less than you do. Colleagues are equal. Teachers are superior. Because there's something about the makabal. There's something in the recipient that when you have to give to someone that doesn't understand it yet fully, you yourself become enriched. So are you a makabal or you're a mashpia? Yes and masha ani. Makabal mina asher, more than what the pauper receives from the wealthy person, the wealthy person receives from the pauper as it's said about Zdok. The same thing here, that there, that you can receive more from your student and then you're a reci- mode of recipient even though you're the one that's giving. That's the power in Siddur of the Mitle Rebbe, which is based on the Alta Rebbe. It's my modem. He explains why the Ebrishta made not safe in Bitchilosan, that the beginning is wedged in the end and the end in the beginning because that is what allows the whole existence to interact with each other. If we thought we were self-contained and have everything... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm complete without anyone else we would never have a give and take of Mashpia Mekabal and the Ebrishter wanted God wanted existence to be a give and take a symbiotic relationship as we see in nature as we see in the human body as we see every functioning system 
definitely divine systems and natural systems, but human beings, when they create systems, you'll see it's all about the give and take. That's the key element, how the collaboration, the cooperation and how everyone contributes their component, and then you have something greater than the sum of the parts, the synergy, the era ela al kolana. So that's what we have in Rish Chedesh El, when it comes on Shabbos, that we don't have only anila deidi v'deidi li, is the makabal anila deidi, I'm reaching to my beloved, and then my beloved responds to me, the mashpia responds to me, as opposed to Nisan, when we say, v'deidi li v'anila, that first came the mashpia, first came the energy from above, and that elicited a response from below. So here it starts from below. This is Rishchei, there's Makabal. But when it begins on Shabbos, you also have a more additional power of the Deidi Li, that we have the power from also from above. And you have the combination of both strengths internalized and integrated from within, which is so vital in any communication and relationship, internalization. But internalization also having the strengths of what the transmitter, what the mashpia, what the giver has to bring to the table as well. As far as Shivad and Nechemta goes, I mentioned the, the Avud Raham, great commentator of the Avud Raham, and uh, based on a Psik Rapsi, which is Medrash, explains the seven weeks of the of the seven weeks of consolation as a story, as a narrative, one flowing story. Where after there was destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, the Jewish people obviously deserved consolation after what happened. So God said, sends them Navi Nachmu Nachmu Ami. In week one, in week two, the Jews say, why are you sending us? Why are you forsake us? Why are you sending us a messenger? Where are you? And week three, though I said we don't read Avteira, but the Hamshach of the Avteira is there, obviously, because it's still the Shiva and the Chemta, the third week. So we, what do we read? So we read, Aniya Sa'ar Eloi Nuchama. O poor tempestuous one. Tempestuous one. Who was not consoled. So Hashem is saying, I hear you. I hear that you're not consoled. And next week, I, I, and we'll talk about that next week, come to console. So what does the week of this week focus on? God's acknowledgement that we're not satisfied. So yes, Nachmu, Nachmu, Ami, a double consolation has great power. The power that the prophets, the power, as I mentioned last week, that humans can console each other, we can support each other. But once you get beyond that, you say, okay, I've received that support, but I want your consolation. I want a connection to the divine force itself because ultimately to change things in life, we need the divine connection. Like we spoke about, that God himself should forgive. So we want you. So God says, I hear you. I hear that you feel forsaken. I hear that you feel desolate, that you feel non-consoled. Even though I send my prophets, my messengers... So you'll, I will respond. What it means in personal life is that every time you cry out in your own pain, in your own need, don't think it's ignored. You may not write me immediately hear the response. It may take a week. It may take more time. It may take less time. But know that every cry is responded. And even when you were consoled and you say, you know what, I need more, don't be ashamed to ask. And this Avteir acknowledges that. Don't be ashamed to ask, to ask for help, ask for support. That's how we get, that's the shtat was the effort we make and the container we make to be able to receive all the great blessings. Okay. With that, let us go to some new questions. And I want to again use this opportunity to tell you all that the questions, thank you for sending questions in. It really is extremely encouraging. And, uh, and it just, for me, it's a personal, a personal, how can I say, I'm deeply touched by the mere fact that people share their personal life stories, even though it's completely anonymous. But to have a platform to be able to speak about these things is, I don't know if there's a greater honor than that. And I want to tell you that even though some questions come in and I, I can't respond to them immediately, they will be responded to in time. It's just simply a backup. But as you'll see, I'm going through them. And uh, here's an opportunity to mention where you can submit your question, if this, you're listening for the first time, or it's always good to remind is at MeaningfulLife.com slash MyLife. There's a forum there, completely anonymous and confidential. We can't trace it, so you can ask anything you like without absolutely any concern about about your identity being exposed, not even to me or to anyone that uh, just sees the questions. However, if you want a, connect, a personal response or in some way want some material that we talk about 
or some request, the only way we can uh, respond to you is by giving us your email address. So you can include that in the form. But that besides that, it's completely confidential. I just really want to reassure everyone listening to this. Um, you also can find at MeaningfulLife.com my life, slash my life, find all the archives of previous episodes. We have now 223 episodes posted. They're all time-stamped in the YouTube, and you can also download it as a podcast. And I can, um, um, I can share with you my gratification that the listening audience has only grown. We're talking about sometimes close to 10,000 people a week, and the, both at YouTube and the podcasts. And uh, that, to me, is a tribute that uh, we're doing the best we can and trying to convey answers, not my opinion or someone else's opinion, but rather things based on sources. And when we don't have a source, when I can't find a specific source, obviously I'll spell that out. And what's also even more gratifying is hearing from you feedback, which is always helpful. You give more sources, sometimes points that I've made that I may have been wrong or need uh, elaboration. So please don't hesitate to participate in any way. It will all be read and all be reckoned with. So with that uh, that uh, so-called announcements, let's go straight to the next questions. And here's some new questions that have been asked. The next question is um, how to turn, I'll just say the first question of this episode, how to turn the experience of being bullied, being bullied into a positive? How do you take the experience of being bullied and turn that into a positive? This refers to adult bullying. So firstly, let me give you cross-referencing. The topic has been addressed. Sadly, it's a reality and deserves being addressed. It's, it's been for too long undercover and uh, un, unnoticed or ignored and it has deep impact. You know, all types of abuse, bullying has a very deep, leaves deep wounds for a lifetime. So it's something that has to be taken extremely seriously, firstly to prevent it in the first place, and then of course to address it when we become aware of it. So I've discussed it in episodes 8, 77 actually was an essay, one of the essays submitted. So in 77 I reviewed that essay, and in episode 127. So that's cross-reference. You know, I might as well mention cross-referencing is also to Rosh Chedeshel and Pasha today. I want to cross-reference to, to episodes 30, 31, 34, 79, 129, and 175. Okay, now to the bullying question. So though I have already discussed back then, being that this is, as I said, unfortunately a, a still a relevant topic, I, I decided to talk about it as well uh, now. And, uh, and especially this has a particular unique angle, and that is how to turn it into something positive. So first, a general introduction. Everything can be turned into positive. Indeed, a step further, according to Chassidus, everything has positive within it, even when it looks negative. That's not justifying in any way minimizing the negativity of it, but there's no such thing as a negative as an end in itself. It's always either has positive energy right beneath the surface that needs to be uh, unveiled or or released, or you work harder and you can see how you can transform it into a positive. It's a foundational element in all Taylor psychology, and especially the Chassidish approach to life, looking at everything in that sense. So, of course, this does not in any way justify or minimize the the challenges and the pain and the hurt caused by bullying or any form of abuse. But once it's happened, there's always something that you can learn from and grow from and become a stronger person. On a very basic level, we have the expression in the verse, right, in Shemais, when the Jews were in Mitzrayim, and they were suffering greatly at the hands of their oppressors, the Egyptians. So it says, As they were afflicted, as they were oppressed, in direct proportion to that, they th- they thrived and they flourished. Why? Because the oppression brought the best out of them. Bullying, again, without in any way justifying, the person who's done it deserves to be accountable, and more than that, or whatever is possible to uh, address the issue, remedy the situation. But if a person has been in some way hurt, has been intimidated, picked upon by fellow students, or as you write, adult bullying, there's all the different forces, the inhumanity that human beings can perpetrate on another, so painful to see. You know, we have enough challenges without of creating man-made ones. But sadly, it exists. 
whatever reason, people have that cruelty in them. They're covering up their own insecurities. They think it gives them power. Whatever the illusion of it is, it's a tremendously painful experience. But at the end of the day, what it do is can make you a stronger person. Because when you connect to your neshama, and you connect to your soul, and you realize that you truly do have value, no matter what, how others have treated you, no matter how others have spoken about you, no matter how they have humiliated you, you have power because you're God's son, or you're God's daughter. You're a child of God. You have a neshama, a chelika, a kama, a divine soul that is, in, in, un, that is uh, ind- indomitable, meaning indestructible. Nothing can hurt it. So when you're hurt, you're hurt on, the, on layers that connect your awareness of that soul. But that, when you connect to that deeper connection, and then you realize that that which doesn't kill me makes me stronger, you come away with a lesson that from the Pasuk, that the mere fact that someone was able to bully you, and it did hurt, and you came out intact and even stronger, tells you nothing can destroy you. It's like when we say, Shtar Shiyotza Lov Ir. Allah which is brought in this context in different scenarios. That what? That when a contract that was never challenged can always be challenged. You could always say the contract was written wrongly, it was forged, wrong witnesses, wasn't done right, I never agreed, missing details. But once a shtar shtar has been challenged, a contract, and has been upheld, you no longer can challenge it. The idea of a, like a court of appeals. You can appeal once, twice, three times. Here it's once. And once it's upheld, you no longer can challenge it. The challenge is a very painful thing. I have a contract. I have an agreement. Why would I want to challenge it? But the challenge ends up causing the contract to become even stronger and ironclad, that you can never challenge it again. Emotionally and psychologically, the same thing. A person lives their lives, and God should bless us all to have peaceful lives. Peaceful life, But you don't know what will happen when a storm strikes. God forbid. When a person has gone through a storm, especially in the context of what we're discussing, bullying, and you come, you, you become, you remain intact, and you're here, still standing, after all that, you come to a point where you recognize and connect to your neshama. You tie yourself, you bind yourself to something greater, then you come to realize nothing can hurt me because I was bullied, and I was hurt in the process, and I'm here, and I'm still here, and I did not disappear. I was not annihilated. That's the positive that can come out of it. And that's what we have to work towards. And this, of course, applies to every given challenge. But here we're talking specifically about this. Okay, next question. An art therapist is asking, which psychological streams are aligned with Judaism? Hi, Rabbi. I hope you're doing well. I resonate so much with your teachings, and I love Hasidus. And I have a question. I'm an art therapist, and I require, and I require to keep growing in psycho. I require to keep growing in psychology studies. For me, it's interesting knowing about the mind, but it's fundamental to learn the soul, the realm of Jewish psychology, because because I know Torah has it all. I don't know where I can find some courses or resources of Jewish psychology and chassid, and chassid psychological tools. I also wanted to ask you, in your opinion, which psychological streams, Jung. Freud, Adler, etc., etc., are aligned with Judaism. Okay. So, number one, I refer you to episodes one. Yes, right, one, episode one. That's the started, Chassidus Applied, My Life Chassidus Applied, talked about this very directly. Episode 101 and episode 136. But in addition to what I said then, and I refer you directly there, I will just direct my response to this specific question. Our, therapist is, our therapy is in general a very interesting form of therapy, like music therapy, using these uh, sensory tools to be able to discover and to be able to heal and grow. So I'm not going to discuss that per se, and I'm very fascinated by your finding the intrigued, the parallels or the need to grow psychologically in other streams, and especially Hasidic psychology and Torah psychology. So to answer your first question, where are there crosses and resources? Well, especially recently there have been there are psychologists, Jewish psychologists, Torah-based psychologists that have gotten together and have created different groups. I remember speaking for a course, a, a one that uh, has been established, finding the parallels with Dr. Uh, Victor Frankel, who established Logotherapy, Man in Search for, Man in Search for Meaning, which we'll talk about in a moment. 
and others, if you go online or if you write to us specifically, we'll be happy to respond and give you some references of resources where you can speak to other therapists and others in the psychological world that are exactly doing exactly that, bridging Torah psychology and secular psychology into a model that hopefully can be far better and far more, far more productive and uh, bring more healing to the world in a Torah-based way. As far as the question, my opinion, psychological stream, well, Freud is probably the most antithetical because, as I've discussed a number of times, Freud's basis of the id, the id, that there is a the pleasure principle, that there's a force inside of us that is completely selfish and sexual and driven just me, 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 and that's the heart of who a human being is, and the ego and superego are superimposed to keep things at bay and to referee and to keep things under control, is antithetical to the Jewish concept of not the id, but the yid. The yud, the pintal the yud, the spark, is really the driving force. That we were all created in the divine image. Yes, in chapter 2 in Noyach, we read about Yetzirah Adam Ram and Urov, that we have also a side to ourselves that's selfish from birth, but from childhood. But in the first chapter, we read that we were each created in the divine image. And that it does not just it's not just a philosophical difference, it has deep psychological implications of what we expect of each other. If we just evolved from human beings, I'm sorry, if human beings just evolved from animals, and all we are is sophisticated animals with a brain, then what can you really expect? A person is fundamentally selfish, and that's that, selfish gene. However, if a person is created in the divine image, and yes, he also has a Yetzir Hara, which means an evil inclination in order to have free will, in order for there to be a battle, which is the purpose of existence, as the Alter Rebbe elaborates in Tanya, then it's a whole different expectation. And we expect the most of you, not the least. Which lines, which, which schools of psychology are more aligned? So I will use firstly what the Friedrich Rebbe said. He was once on a train and they were discussing different economic theories, capitalism versus communism and Marxism and socialism and the different versions and variations. So they asked the Friedrich Rebbe, what does he think? What is the Tater's approach? He said the Tater comes from God. All these others are man-made systems. Since it comes from God, it has the best of all worlds. I would say the same thing here. Every school of psychology, including Freud, has truths that can be learned from. When you talk about a Torah psychology, you're talking about a psychology of the one who created the soul and the psyche and therefore can tell us what makes it work best. And yet, the Torah doesn't speak in terms of psychology, so using psychological language, you can complement each other in a sense where psychology, you'll find some psychologies that are very aligned. Probably the most aligned of all is, well, Jung is very spiritual, but even more aligned is Viktor Frankl, who he saw not the id, and not uh, social uh, survival, or not power and influence, but meaning, the search for meaning is the driving force of a soul. And when one search for meaning, they can deal with any challenge in life. Here's not the place to go through it in detail, but there are, there are conferences that have been held on this topic with talks delivered. The Rebbe himself refers to Frankel in this context, and, and you could see that it approves of the general approach and its similarities based on Torah thinking. It's not exactly, but it's aligned. Again, in every school of psychology, you're going to find truths that are focused on this element. And as soon as you focus on the soul, as soon as you focus that there's some divine part us, a higher calling, meaning, purpose, then you're aligning it more and more to Jewish thinking, Torah thinking. And, and I mind you, universal Torah thinking, not just Jewish thinking for Jews, universal approach, how we look at the human race, how we look at the human condition, how we look at pain and suffering, how we look at all our psychological, emotional, and personal challenges. Okay. Next question, life insurance. What is the Rebbe's opinion on buying life insurance? So, in my research, I haven't found the black and white opinion where the Rebbe says yes or no. It appears that the Rebbe not, didn't tell anyone not to do it. Um, but there are some references in, a, in some sikhs that I want to refer to. So, practically speaking, there's nothing from the Rebbe that says do not buy it. But there's also an attitude how we look at life insurance. So there's a sikha from the Rebbe in the early years, yud based Tammuz, I believe, yet Tov Shin Yud Aleph, where the Rebbe speaks about it. Apparently someone who was in the business was there, the Fabrengen, and it was customary for the Rebbe, especially in the early years, to talk about things, about somebody who may be in a certain business and learn lessons from it. 
So the Rebbe began the Sikha. Let me see if I have a copy here. Yeah, I do. He started, it says in the Gemara, the Gemara in Aveda Zara, where Rabbi, Rabbi Alexander, he announced, who wants to have life? Who wants life? And people gathered and said, give us life. And he brought the Pasuk, Mia Isha Chofetz Chaim. Who is the person that Chofetz that desires life? And he goes on how to do good and avoid evil. That brings you life. So the Rebbe says, from this was an nostalgia, from this evolved in the opposite extreme, a business called life insurance. And instead of telling people, go ahead and find ways to live a long life, buy insurance because something may happen to you. So it's the opposite. And yet the Rebbe continues, even though he speaks in that tone, in other words, the focus should be on life, not to focus on being when life will end and what you're going to do to protect yourself and protect your family. And he brings a story, actually, from the Frida Kareb, said about the about said about a Jew that went into the Rebbe Rashab, and he was consulting with Rebbe Rashab how should he prepare his will, how he should divide his money. That after he after Arichas Yomav, after he's after he finishes, after he passes away, he wants to divide his money. Um, And he's consulting the Rebbe Rashab how to do that. So the Rebbe Rashab said to him, the gate is that, that, that you leave for the expressions of Elamis, which means that for the future, it's better that you should do a Lam Chatir B'chayecha. Your life, your world, Elamis, the world should be lived now. In your, you should see your world today, not the world to come should come later. Make it happen now. What that means is that you should prepare to give to live a long life and give the Zdokha now in ways that during your lifetime helps tell the mitzvahs and so on. So in other words, the focus is on living, not on passing away. And in general, it's more pleasant to be talked to somebody about living longer, and not in case you pass away. So the Rebbe continues, however, the fact, however, is that in life insurance, the, the, both the broker and the life insurance company and the person who's buying it, at the end of the day, they'd, they'd want you to live long, because that way they make their money. The money in life insurance is made for the people that don't pass away. So in essence, they do want you to live. But the focus should be on the living and not so much on the what happens if. That's the, the basic gist of it. Then the Rebbe goes on, and explains that there's an Aderech and Aveda in Musa that you focus on people and tell them how if they do this, they'll die and, and, and all to frighten and, and terrify the Nevesh Shabam is the animal soul by telling it all the punishments and the death that will come to it due to its bad behavior. So the Rebbe says, that's an approach with Nefesh Shabbat, is that's a Musadika approach. And we do everything possible to kill the animal soul. But Chassidus says, we don't try to kill. The Merem Magid said once, that a small hole in the body is a large hole in the soul. And we know the derech of Chassidus Shavet, the derech of Chassidus is to work with the body, transform it, transform it. Focus more on how when you do good things, it gives you a long life. And when you have long life, then you can serve a God better and so on. And the Rebbe goes on to speak about these two approaches. So therefore, from time to time, you may have to be reminded about Yema Misa, about the day of death, in order to be able to get the dividends, like we, with life insurance, in order the dividends for a person to do Tater Mitzvahs on an ongoing basis. But that's an exception. The main focus has to be in living good life, a healthy life, a long life. A long life of serving God and doing what you have to be done. Very nice sikha. It's in Yud based Thomas Tovshin Yud Alef. Um, and with that, let us, I also remember, now that I'm mentioning it, it just came to me. There's a sikha from the Friedrich Rebbe, and I, I have to look up where that is. But if somebody knows where it is, if you don't mind, if you send me uh, an email, I'd be appreciated. It's in the Tshins, I think Tovshin Beis or Tovshin Gimel in the early years in the, when the Friedrich Rebbe came to America, where he mentions life insurance, he says in America is a thing called life insurance, but the greatest insurance, I think he says there, is Teirah Mitzvahs. So I'm not sure if he elaborates more or if he negates, but it'll be interesting to see the similarity to this sikha that I just read. Okay. Let us move on. Now there's a bunch of follow-ups. And then, of course, we're going to continue with the question, the Chassidus question, which is a bigger topic. So let's do some follow-ups. Let's see how far we can go. Oh, it was a lot. A lot more than I expected. Okay. So 
So let's do a few that were from previous weeks, and then we'll go to last week, and uh, and if, uh, hopefully I can cover as much as I can, as, as much as possible this week. In episode 221, that's a few weeks ago, we spoke about of the derech. I hate that expression, but that's the term people use, so I'm using it. Basically, how to deal with uh, what the causes are and how to deal with children or teenagers or adults, for that matter, that leave at least ostensibly for the while, Tehidah Mitzvahs. Nachman al-Litzlan. So I have here two responses, follow-ups. We did already, I believe, a follow-up on this. But here's one is supporting what you said. Another one is challenging what you said. Okay, it's coming from two different directions. So supporting what you said, because I spoke there that some psychologists, and I, I heard from a psychologist years ago, that for somebody to really make an, a shift that's especially an outward shift, a fundamental radical shift in their lives usually requires something radical happening to them. And often it's abuse. So someone's writing that, yes, there's support to that. A recent psychological study by Dr. David Rosemarin, Rosemarin of Harvard and Dr. David Pelkovitz of Yeshiva University, published in this month's issue of the Child Abuse and Neglect Journal, sees a link between abuse and the decision to abandon the strictly observant Jewish life. The question they dealt with was why some young adults break away from their parents' lifestyle. While Jews are no more likely to be sexually abused than other Americans, individuals who have left the Orthodox community are more than four times as likely to have been molested as children than the general population. This new study study has found. Okay, I'd rather not have such supporting words, but it it is what it is. Now, another writer challenges what I said. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the hard work and dedication you put in doing the My Life series, so thank you. Secondly, I listened to you discuss the reasoning for those who go off the dead, quote-unquote, in episode 220. I guess it was 220 and 221. You mentioned the theory of those who theorize and what you heard from a lot of professionals, the reason for people who, quote-unquote, openly defy what they grew up with, unquote, is because something happens with their wiring. From what I understand, from what I understood, they seem to be saying that the people who change their lifestyle openly must have some trauma that would lead them to be willing to change from the way they grew up to the different than to, to be different than their families and communities. I take issue with this idea for a few reasons. One, that would imply that there are a lot of trauma that there is a lot of traumatizing going on to lead to so many people leaving the community, which is possible, but hopefully not true that our children, adolescents, are being traumatized at such high rates, leading to so many to leave the fold. Two, using that same theory, are those who come to the fold also leaving their previous lifestyles lifestyles because of trauma? Three, if the option to openly change a lifestyle because of intellectual honesty was so far-fetched, why is that the foundation of Yiddishkeit? For example, it all started with Avram Avinu changing his lifestyle, not because his parents or community wronged him or traumatized him, but because he came to an intellectual conclusion that their lifestyle was wrong. Number four, using this sort of logic is being from mostly because of being socialized, being socialized to be so, to be so from birth by our family and community. Then we aren't really believers in the thirteen animamins; rather, we are just socially programmed to believe. Number five. There are, there, are prob- there are probably tens or even thousands of sources in classical texts and chassidus that discuss the idea of learning about Hashem in order to know more, in order to believe more. Are all those texts just covering up the truth that those who remain from do so because of being comfortable with the lifestyle, not because they are willing to be intellectually honest and open about their thoughts? Number six. The last, number six. This logic also implies that all the leaders, thinkers in our community who do come up with an intellectual truth, in their mind that Yiddishkeit is false, who do come up with an intellectual truth in their mind that Yiddishkeit is false, even though they think that to be true, wouldn't be willing to be honest with their followers about the truth as they have come to to know it. Could it be that unless they would be traumatized, our leaders couldn't be trusted to make change and be honest if they knew something to be false? Okay, the questions are all fine questions. Just briefly, let me just respond, I think, briefly, because I don't think I need a lot of elaboration.
Yes, there's no question the foundation of Yiddishkeit is Kabbalah sale, acceptance, but also understanding. And there are many good explanations that explain its beauty. But let's not minimize the impact of growing up in a community and a family. If we were just left to philosophical queries, not everyone would turn into Avram Avinu. Avram was Avram, Echad Hay Avram. There are people that did. There are people who came to it through their search and through their seeking and went through different systems and so on and so forth. But is a major factor is going to the right yeshivas, getting the right chinuch, having a family that supports it in a healthy way. That doesn't take away. Why? Because if it's done with a good chinuch, a good education, a good social programming, there's nothing wrong with social programming. But then you grow into an adult and you can think for yourself and you continue the journey, not just doing it because your parents did it. Nothing wrong with that. But if it's something that's being done just completely mechanically and there's no personal connection to it, so a person may live their whole life like that. Many people just follow the guidelines. But then when there's some type of trauma, you can rest assured it's going to have a big impact. Now even growing up in a healthy home, in a healthy chinuch, and getting all the good things, trauma has impact. That doesn't mean to say that if someone doesn't have trauma and they stay, it's for false reasons. That's not the point. You can be for many good reasons. The trauma just shifts and like throws us like a jolt. It's like someone driving on a road, and suddenly someone hits you, God forbid, and it shakes you up and throws you out of your car. That's the point here. It's not the point that if a person doesn't have trauma, you can't trust. Because, because, uh, because you see what happens with trauma. So the point that I'm saying is that the bottom line is, this is not suggesting at all that there is no basis and strong basis. And there are many people, by the way, that have been traumatized and have remained. Whether whatever reason it is, sometimes actually they dig, dig deeper and they found tremendous reasons to connect to Judaism. So your points are, are logical arguments and questions, but it's not really what I was talking about. And I don't see the contradiction between the two. I was speaking about one specific scenario where a person can grow up in an com- environment. Why would they suddenly be thrust and completely? It's usually not just philosophical reasons. That's the main thing. Because we're not just philosophical human beings. We also have emotions and feelings and so on and so forth. And yes, every one of us has that challenge is to go through in our personal life and look at, are we doing things mitzvah sanosha mulamoda, mechanically, or because of a deeper avoid? As the Alter Rebbe explains in chapter 15 in Tanya, the need for avoid means going out of your comfort zone, doing something more than what you're just used to in your habit or your pattern. Okay. Another question was discussed, was in episode 219, and that was, Oh, regarding the question, by the way, using the same theory, I talked about that. Can we say that people came to the fold also due to previous lives of trauma? We talked about it. It's possible. It's not the only possibility, but it's also possible. There's nothing wrong with saying that. It doesn't dismiss or minimize that person's uh, change. And I don't know, maybe it's a good change. If they came to Yiddishkeit due to that, we wish it was not through trauma, but sometimes that's the cause. Okay. Next question was, can we establish policy based on a chesidah shehergish? This was in episode 219. So this is just a follow-up. Mini Yisrael sabah It is noteworthy that the mitzvahs that the others performed were like hergeshim of ruach hakedish in a sense, and menhagim. It wasn't written or recorded, at least not publicized. Uh, well, yes, maybe before Matan Teri you could say it was more than hergish. I guess it was more of a resonating truth that they came to. I don't know if we can compare it to the Chassidish allegation we were talking about, when, especially now after Matan Teda, when we do have a Teda, and we have commandments, and we are told what to do and what not to do. So then you're talking about a world that didn't have a Teda yet, so Avram Avinu, or other people who were seekers, came to certain things, they came to truth through their own journey. But I don't know if you can just suddenly say, because of that, all Chassidish allegation we establish policy on. Just commenting, let's continue. Those mitzvahs developed into the Teda as we know it, Example, tefillin from the sticks that Yaakov stripped. The reading on Simcha's Teda, the last letter being Lamed and the first of the Teda Beis, which is heart, might allude to the Hedegish Minig component. Or it says, Oz Yashir Bnei Yisrael, Shar Nemer El Yashir. That from this we learn Tchis HaMesim. Moshe's allusion to Mashiach was a Hedegish. Mashiach will arrive on Simcha's Teda 
The power of the heart in Hagim and Geshim in a totally holy context is very powerful and its relevance today cannot be diminished. This is what this person is writing. Pesach, the first redemption of the, of this, and the Seder are based on personal Minhagim. They make sense, of course. The entire Sudas Mashiach appeared from the Baal Shem Tev, was developed over 200 years until mainstream to what we know it to now. A meaning that stood the test of time and is duly recorded and chronologized chrono- chronologized in the annals of Jewish observance becomes Teda, and will be the ultimate Seder of the freedom of the last exile. We, our generation, is to connect to the, the end to the beginning, not Seifim B'tchilosan, B'tchilosan B'seifim. The end beginning is where's the end and the end in the beginning. It began with a mini Yisrael, and that's how it will be completed. Simchas Teda, Avram Samach B'simchas Teda, Yitzchak Samach B'simchas Teda, Yaakov celebrated Simchas Teda, and the Rebbe's Ushpiz is on Simchas Teda. And concludes, Nasati l'chochem v'yech kameit. Well, that's a little, uh, okay, thank you so much for bestowing your chochme and v'yech kameit, and we should try to allude from that. With all respect, my friend, let me tell you this. First of all, all the citations you quote are the Ovis, the Merkava, Baal Shem Tev, and the Rabbeim. The question was not whether the Rabbeim and the Baal Shem Tev and the Ovis have authority. Obviously they have authority, and I would even say the Hergeshim are not just plain Hergeshim, they don't just suddenly have a feeling it's going to make Mashiach Suda. You said Ruch HaKedish, exactly right. Ruch HaKedish is not a Hergish. Ruch HaKedish is a divine revelation. And people like that can be trusted, just like we know Moshe Rabbeinu could be trusted by Aminu Ba'ashem or Moshe Avde. So when they come, I would not call it a Hergish. Sometimes they themselves said, I have a Hergish, I feel towards something. The Rebbe spoke about that a number of times. But it's coming from a Rebbe. We were talking about Chassidah Shargation, whether you can make policies that based on our human beings like us, based on a feeling, based on an intuition. And the answer is absolutely not. And even with the Rabbeim, it's all based on, everything is based on, even Simcha State is Amin Yisrael, yes. But it's not some Amin Yisrael somebody came with, concocted. It's based and founded and grounded on Teda and Yiddish Shemayim and people who are saturated with connection to God. So to make a statement that this is a, opens the door, a license for us to do things based on irrigation, I would be very careful. That could be very dangerous, actually. To say there's no value for Chassidah Shargish, we discussed then there is value, but in context. So that's that. Let us see more now. Now the next series of follow-ups, there's a whole bunch of follow-ups here about writing a pidgin to other Rebbes. I have one, two, without exaggeration, at least... 10 or maybe more responses. I'm thinking, let me see here. Then we have the parenting. It's all good stuff, what can I tell you? So let me do a few of the pidyanus, and then maybe I'll stop and I'll continue more next week. So the question was about writing a pidyan to other Rebbes besides your own. In last episode 223, you can listen to that. I'm not going to repeat what was said there. So here's someone writing. What if it's not a pidyon, just a brach? You're not writing a pidyon nefesh, but you're asking for a brach. The Rebbe says that every yid can give a brach, every Jew can give a blessing. So if you meet someone who you feel has some special schusim, special merits, and you ask him for a blessing, should you feel guilty because you should just ask the Rebbe for a blessing? And let's say you did ask the Rebbe, is there even any point in asking this other fellow for a brach? So that's why I discussed that it's not such a black and white issue here. It depends what you're talking with. People bench each other all the time. And we get brachas from our parents. And we get brachas from friends. And we get different types of brachas. The question is, really, the relationship you have with your Rebbe. If you go to a Rebbe for a Rebbe Shabracha, is there room to go to another Rebbe for a bracha? Now you could say, what's there to lose? That's why I spoke very intently about the, not just the loyalty, but that deep connection, what a Rebbe is. Shama Klolis, the one that gives you your energy, flows through that Rebbe. But I was also careful not to impose this position on everybody because you have to determine if you take have a Rebbe like that. I'm not going to give Musa to someone who says, I don't feel that connection to the Rebbe. Maybe you deserve Musa, maybe you need to fabreng with people. But I wanted to just put it into a balanced approach to know, yes, Aiskashis to Rebbe is a very serious thing. And, and if, the, if the Rebbe that you're going to for a bracha, that's the person. But does that mean you can't get a bracha from anyone else? 
A pan may be different, in, as you're writing, so I make that qualification. But if it's a bracha from a Rebbe as a Rebbe, there you may go into that area. But again, this is not something which I think is a black and white thing that the Shulchan Aruch that says, you're allowed to, you're not allowed to. Nowhere does it say if you give a pan to another Rebbe that you have, that in some way you've done a terrible crime. But it could be on a psychological or emotional level, it's a certain, I don't say inappropriate, but not the way to go. Okay, another question writes, Dear Rabbi Jacobson, I follow with great interest your wonderful lectures addressing topics that many shy away from. The most recent episode featured a discussion about the propriety of Chabad Chassidim asking for advice or blessings from a Rebbe other than their own. You began your reply by discussing the concept that a Rebbe is not Einer, a Rebbe is only one. Later you mentioned that every individual has his or her own channel flowing through their particular Rebbe's. Yes, I mentioned like there's a Nasi, Moshe Rabbeinu, there's a Shar HaKelo, the gate that everybody has to go through, and then every Shevet, every tribe had its Nasi for that Shevet, for that tribe. So there's a concept of a Nasi Yador, there's a concept of a Nasi of a community. That's what I mentioned, correct. Now, Nada Nada Pashta, rivers that, that um, branch off. You be, now, these two themes seemed a little contradictory to me. The first is based on Dabar Echad Ladar, that is one spokesman for the generation, so to speak, with the implicit assumption that the Lubavitcher Rebbe's war in their respective generations, the Dabar Echad, that one leader. According to this approach, everyone should be followers of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe's. The second point they made reflects an approach that is a bit more universalist, allowing, say, a Gerer Chassid to find fulfillment with his Rebbe a Breslover with his, a Labavitcher with his. What is problematic, according to this approach, is just switching lanes. In addition to the apparent contradiction between these two approaches, some additional thoughts. When the Rebbe was alive, was it not the practice of Echsidim to bring Pidyanis to the oil of his predecessor at least once or twice a year? Are there not stories of Rabbein sending requests for blessings to other Rebbes? The example that comes to mind is the Alter Rebbe to the Barditchever, who was not his Rebbe. Isn't there also a quote by the Friedrich Rebbe in Rishimus, perhaps, that to some extent the Mitla Rebbe and Samach Tzedek were Shnei Melochim Bekeser Achas, two kings with one crown. Number three, later you related a story about your grandfather. It's a great story. Your grandfather was bound to his Rebbe literally by blood. He would never see that connection compromised in any which way. But can this be compared to a Chassid of today, especially a younger one who may have literally no physical connection with the Rebbe? Now you didn't say you now you did say it wasn't Hayral al Rabim, which means a director for everyone, but the context can be can be lost on many. Many can come away feeling that it would be wrong for them to seek help elsewhere. A chassid feeling for his Reb is one thing, an approach taught to a new generation is another. Number four. Why does one right go to a Reb? There are sophisticated reasons involving the five levels of the soul and gates and shvatim. But I suspect that for the vast majority of people, those are not the real reasons. The reasons are distress. They are a pain. They are in pain. They are loneliness. They are need. This is all good and fine to talk about Dabar Echad, the Dar, and share inspiring stories. But they, but why deprive people who may have found a good opportunity, Al Piteda, Al Taras Akedish, to find solace, to find advice, to find, dare I say, blessing elsewhere? Sure, sure, they could talk to Mashpia, they could go to the hill, they could watch videos and write to the Igrus Kedish and speak to three Hasidish Rabbonim. But apparently there hasn't been, that hasn't been working for them. And now they're trying to, something else. And all it takes is a feeling that they're doing something wrong or, or a betrayal to the Rebbe for them to lose that opportunity. Why, why are we afraid of that? Wishing you and your family good health, nachas, prosperity, much success, with much respect and much love, and much anonymity. <laughs> okay, well. Um, I, I don't know if I have to respond to this. I read the response because it's a legitimate comments. Um, I don't say agree with every detail, but so what? And uh, I already said my part, part last in last week's program about the topic. I'll just comment one or two brief comments and then we'll move on. Um, as I mentioned, it is subtle. It's not so simple. Because there's what the doctrine says, and when a person has a total discussion to the Rebbe, obviously he has all his amshachas, where is he going elsewhere? But as you point out, not everybody has that. What do you do then? So do you work on the discussions, or do you 
Let the person do as they see fit under the circumstances. It's not such a black and white answer. Because working as kashas takes time. And we're speaking now, I'm speaking to, uh, to thousands of people who are going to listen to this. You can't just say one thing, size, size fits all. So I could talk about the doctrine. But I also want to share the subtleties of all because it depends how you feel. If you feel such as kashas, it's very admirable. My grandfather was absolutely felt that way. And would I go say, I tell the story, when I tell everybody you have to feel that way, you have to work on feeling that way. Now, to go and find all kinds of different rebbes and run from one to the next is also, if you think about it, where's the integrity to that? It's like, you know, it becomes very superficial in a way. Where's the real connection? So, of course, we can sit here and be purists and talk about that deepest kashas and no issue with that at all. Let people fabring about it. But let that be a force of inspiration, not a force of, of, of uh, imposition. That's the key points I would make regarding this thing. And this is, this is why we're here. This is the platform to talk about these matters in order to try to get to a better and clearer place about these topics. I'm going to stop here as far as follow-up because time, as usual, runs quicker than you think. The sight left, as they say. Time flies. And I will continue this discussion because there's a lot of money, other comments, and I'm sure more will come in. Also, parenting I wanted to continue. Okay, I have no way around this because time is time. But I want to go to the Chassidus question because we began a topic and I already got a few good complaints. Why do you ask questions without giving an answer? Well, it was not intentional. It's just a big topic and you have to cover it intently. So the question that began last week, it's a very, it's, maybe it was a little dense and somewhat technical, but I assure you that we're going to get to a place of Chassidus applied and see how fundamental this topic is. So bear with me. I just want to do it in a grounded way, in a way that's based on the sources, and not just talk about it. I want to be able to give you sources so those of you that want to look it up can look it up. Those of you that don't like the technical so much, so just uh, just bear with me as I said. We will get to the concepts themselves and, of course, their application to our lives. But I began with the way one should always begin topics like this, the grounding. And what is the question? There's a double question on the table. We know there were two great Kabbalists that lived in Sfas. One was Ramak, Ramak, Ramoshe Kardaviro. The other was the Arizal, Yitzchok, Rabbeinu Yitzchok Ari. Rabbeinu Yitzchok. Um, Yitzchok Luria was his full, full name. Isaac Luria, as they call him. But we call him the Arizal. So these two great Kabbalists, they taught and they produced a tremendous amount of literature. Arizal, most of it wasn't, wasn't written by him, it was spoken, but his great student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, documented it all. We have the Eitz Chaim and the Pri Eitz Chaim and all the Sha'arim and all the Svarim. The Ramak, in his end, did similar, he left a lot, but, but he wrote, the Pardis is his magnum opus, the Pardis is the main him, but he has other Svarim as well, a great commentary on Zoyar. They lived, they were contemporaries. The Ramak was a little older, passed away before the Arizal, the Arizal actually utilized him. So the question is asked, what is the difference between these two schools of Kabbalah? Because there are definitely major differences. And as I quoted, and I'll just sum it up, that the Svarim talk about the, the, the Talmidim of the Ramak, and that is, I'll speak about the differences, and Chassidah speaks about it. So what really is the fundamental difference, in a broad sense, between the two? The second question is, how do you reconcile the fact that there's such differences to the point that their students wrote that they shouldn't mix the two Kabbalahs? Starting with Ramem Mepanai, who studied both, first the Ramak and then the Arizal. And the Ramaz and others said, don't mix these two Kabbalas, they're very different worlds. How do you reconcile that with the Alter Rebbe's Maimir in Maimorim, uh, we quoted the Maimorim HaKtsorim. I'm sorry, not Maimorim HaKtsorim, no, no, no. Maimorim Razal, page 456 that the truth is that there's this generally the same Kabbalah, one is Bechlal, Masai, and Mona. That that is all, encompasses also the Ramak. So what I began on doing, summing up last week, was the sources for all of this. And just to sum up briefly, we brought from different sources, from the introductions to the Priyat to the Priyat Chaim and to uh, the Eitz Chaim, uh, the end of the Eitz Chaim, and the Emek HaMelech, and the Pelach Harimen, and some other Svarim where we discussed that essentially the differences as they lay them out is one is the difference that the Ramak spoke in Elam Ateu and, and that is on Elam Atikun. Another difference, the Ramak spoke Nukudis, about Nukudis points, that is all Partsufim, or sometimes Sfiris and Partsufim. In other words, not just points, 
but as they develop into complete structures. And the third difference that the Rameh writes, that the Ramak spoke more the Pshat in Kabbalah, so-called Pshat, and that is as the Seid within Kabbalah. So we see clearly, to the point, as I said, there were concerns that the Ramaz, I didn't quote this, the Ramaz in his Igris Ramaz, Igeris Ches, writes about not mixing the two. So let me give you a few more sources about the differences between the two, just as to fill out the sources. There's a sefer called Yede Bina of the Ramaz as well, Tezer Chelik Aleph, page Ayin Beis, where he discusses as well the difference. A sefer called Vayakal Mesha, Ramesha Prager, in his introduction, discusses it as well. And interestingly, there's a tshuva from Chavis Yoyer, famous tshuva from Chavis Yoyer, tshuva Reish Yud, 210, in the name of a Makubal, also talks about the difference. There he talks about he doesn't understand the difference. There he's talking in a way that we should avoid Kabbalah. He was like, I can't say anti-Kabbalah, but Kabbalah was beyond uh, the pale that he felt most people can uh, connect with. But I just want to give you these sources. I already gave other sources last week. And one more I want to talk about right now before I get to the actual difference between the two, which I will begin talking about, is something cited and I mentioned in the Rebbe Rashab's Maimer Vayita Eshel. Tofresh Nun. I'm saying for my mom, Tofresh Nun, page 334. So he cites a Hagdome to the Sefer Eitzur Schaim. Eitzur Schaim is another one of the Svarim that the Rab Chaim Vital wrote. That's why he knows the word name Chaim. Eitz Chaim, Pri Eitz Chaim, Eitzur Schaim, that he was the one selected by the, Reb, by the Rizal to be his so called scribe. And he wrote down these data. So in the introduction to Sefer Eitzhah's Chaim, this fascinating introduction, which is very relevant to this whole talk here, to this whole discussion, he talks about the Ishtalshals and Golas. Then the beginning of Golas, the Nitzutzes, the sparks, were not that sunk in. They were not that um, buried and lost. And that's why they were able to be Mavara Birudim through Gemara, through Nigla, And did not need so much primis atel. But as Golas became intensified, he writes, you needed to go and find the deeper secrets to help us redeem the, the darker sparks. And that required going deeper into, in the Igvas of the Meshich, deeper into primis atel. So then he says, in that itself, first started the Ramak. He spoke Besei Primis Bechokmas Emes. But since his Nisham was still from Oilam Ateyu, therefore he did not speak, he spoke only the secrets of the Nekudis, points. Chetseini Shela Primis, he calls it, from the outer of the inner, Primis Ateyu. And that's why Ein Lonu Shum Eisek Alpidarke, that's why we don't go Eisek, this is a very extreme position, obviously we're going to talk about this as well, that you don't follow the Ramak's approach. That's the Seid Primis, and that was revealed by the Ariza. Which only intensifies the question then. So, how could you say that's Bechlam Asayimon? And more importantly, according to this, after the Ariza, and we discussed it last week as well, they shouldn't even be learning the Ramak. And the Ariza himself said that's not correct. It is a process, which is what we're going to be elaborating upon. But before we talk about the, um, how they come together, we have to talk about their differences. Because clearly all these sources indicate major differences between the two. But before, uh, to address that, I'm going to point out a few more differences. So one difference we talked about, Toyu and Tikkun, Nekudis and Pratsufim, and then there's a few others that Chassidus talks about. There's a famous expression, Tzamech Tzedek brings it, but apparently it's from the al Tareb, the Ramak la Yoda me'inyan atzimtzum. The Ramak didn't know about the Tzimtzum. Referring to the Tzimtzum, the Tzimtzum Harishin, which is the Chiddush of the Ariza. The beginning of Eitz Chaim and Eitz Chaim and Mo've Sha'arim, the Ariza speaks about the the, 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 the Eirin Sof filled the entire expanse of what would be existence. And then came a Tzimtzum Harishin, a quantum leap, a black hole, complete concealment. A real paradigm shift. And that Tzimtzum, it says, the Ramak did not know of. That's going to begin to explain the difference between Ramak and Arizal. That's one thing. 
Um, it was a result of that that Amak's approach in general, as Chassidus explains, and particularly I'm referring to a mimer from the Alter Rebbe called the, the Biur of David al Bnei Yisrael Yeshuvu Tovkuf Samach Gimel. It's in Memory of Mura Zokin's Tovkuf Samach Gimel, page 318 and on. And this is also discussed in other places, not always mentioning the Ramak, that in general the Ramak, because of the didn't know of the Tzimtzum, his approach of the divine relationship with existence is not quite as distant as when you know the Tzimtzum. So his approach was more what's called Ilva'ol. There's a relationship between the divine and existence. Obviously, it's a relationship, one is a creator and one is a creation. But the divine that is beyond completely from the Ramak's Kabbalah is not part of the equation. You either explain it by it being that it's not part of what God wanted to engage with, however you explain it. But the bottom line is, by the Ramak, there's the concept of Keser. And Keser is, he has a whole section where he calls, is Keser Einsof? And he holds Keser is not Einsof. Einsof is Einsof and Keser is Keser. Because you can't attribute Einsof to, to an entity. So that's fine. But still, he still sees that there's some relationship. Because he has the expression that he says that the distance from Keser to Asiya, the distance from Asiya to Keser, doesn't compare to the distance from Keser to Ainsaf. But Chassidus emphasizes, he doesn't say Keser and Asiya are equal. He just says the distance between Asiya and Keser is nothing compared to the distance between Keser and higher. But, but Keser is still closer to higher than Asiya is to higher. So if, using the example that Chassidus brings the, the Tzemach Tzadik brings it, the Rebbe Rashab quotes it in his Maimorim, especially in Posech Eliyot, Tafresh Nuches, his Agos, that, for example, when you have the number infinity, so one in a trillion are equal to that. But Keser is not like one in a trillion to Ainsaf, because he says it's more distant, Asi is more distant from Keser than, I'm sorry, Keser is more distant from Ainsaf than Asi is from Keser, but he doesn't say they're equal. So that means Keser is so-called closer to infinity than Asi is. Why? Because by the Ramak, he understood Kabbalah, and based on all the Kabbalah before him, in a context of more that there's a structure of what's called ill of all, cause and effect. And therefore, the, the relationship is one of a commensurate one, that we can connect to the divine. And there's great power in that a concept, because that's what we want to do, Ardus, to connect. So, Mahu Chanun, Afata Chanun, just like God is compassionate, so are we compassionate. So, God is giving, so are we giving. Mahu Rachum, He's compassionate, so are we. So there's the relationship in the spheres that there's a certain relationship. But because of this, the Ramak has a whole bunch of things that are different than the Arizal's approach. This is what I said, because of the symptom, he doesn't know of the symptom. Also because of the, the Keser that I just described. And by that, by the Arizal, it's the opposite. Keser and Asiya are totally equal. And the symptom actually reveals that, because the symptom addition shows that in order for existence to even begin, even Keser, even Ak, you have to have a complete symptom. Because before that is completely non-existent, you can't associate any structure, even keser, even rotsen, any tayar, any definition to the divine. So from the Arizal's point of view, the distance between the divine and existence is far deeper. But as we'll discuss, that in a way creates a, also a deeper connection as well. So in a sense, you could say that Arizal taught the einareich, the, the, the infinite distance between existence and the divine, and the Ramak taught about the connection and relationship. But we still have to explain how does that have to do with Toyu and the Kudus and so on, which we will do. But I wanted to begin with that. Now there's more in the difference between the Rizal and the Ramak. And, and of course alluded to even in Tanya, right in chapter 2, the Hagah, also in chapter 48 in the Hagah, and chapter 9 of Shari Yechudamunah, three Hagahs that are very similar in theme. And we see, can see there also the difference between Ramak and Rizal, because you'll see the connection to the Rambam. But this I'll leave for the next episode as we develop this idea further. There's also more differences. What else do I want to say? Um, uh, that, of course, in the Kabul of the Ramak, you're not going to find the whole concept of the Kav, and the Rishimu, and the elements like Ak. Well, Ak, yes, but not, not in detail. Does he mention that? He, he has some type of mention. I don't know if it's elaborate or at all mentioned. And, of course, Shvira Sakelem, which is connected to Toyu. So even though the Ramak is speaking in Toyu, he himself does not talk about Toyu or Shvir Sakel. But we'll talk about that more as we develop this further. I wanted to um, 
give us some sources to this idea of I know, unaware of the tzimtzum, is the Eid Ateir in Yonim, page 119-120, and the end of the Maimer, Valmi Sidam Yuni, Tafri Samachay from the Rebbe Rashab, and Samach Vov, Vayelach Maimer, of course, is the famous Maimer, where he talks about the difference between Ramem Epanoi, who says, yes, Keser is Ein Sof, and the Ramak who says it's not Ein Sof, and the mile of each one of them, and actually says that the Ramak is more Machav, because Ein Sof can be defined by Keser. But still, the Ramak's explanation is still not sufficient as he elaborates there. And we need Arizal and Chassidus. And Ayin Bey's chapter 164 also talks about this issue of Kesa that I just mentioned. The Ago of Tanya we're going to discuss. And we're going to talk about some other differences between them as well. Especially regarding also the understanding of the Sphiris. And, uh, and then there's a lot more interesting things to come, especially from the Rebbe. There's two very powerful Sikhs where the Rebbe speaks about the difference between the Ramak and Nariza al Naveda. And we're going to end up not just understanding the difference between the two, but how they ultimately really join as one. That's going to be the most fascinating part, because here it keeps on very, very apparent that they're very, very different, to the point that they should not be mixed by opinion of others. And yet we'll find how Chassidus actually shows how they're both part of a bigger picture. So we'll leave that for the next part. And with that, I'm going to... Um, move to the essays of this week the essays we have three essays as we usually do essay number one the greatest female power just get my things in order here by not uh, the greatest female power not the one Hollywood tells this is by Sarah Spielman age 38 Brooklyn New York So she writes, Jewish women are often seen as inferior or second-class citizens by the world, since their innate roles are more often inside their home and they are obligated to fulfill fewer mitzvahs than their male counterparts. This can be a major issue for people when considering a Hasidic lifestyle. However, quite the opposite is true. Hasidic teachings by the Chabad Rabbein, particularly in modern times by the Lubavitcher Rebbe, raised an awareness of the special merits and tasks of women, especially when it came to to child-rearing and, of the, and the future of Jewish children and the Jewish nation. And goes on to quote Sikhs from Boy and Bishal Tafshinun Beis, 5752, and with personal context, and talks about actually the greatest female power, and that's not the one emphasized in Hollywood. Well done, a topic that needs to be addressed more and more. And uh, this and the other essays that are posted, the new ones that are posted, can be seen at MeaningfulLife.com slash MyLife. You go to the essay section, and if you subscribe to our weekly emails, we send out the essays as they are posted. Very, very well done. I especially enjoyed the part about Shira's Dvera, which is about the song of Dvera, and, um, and I highly recommend reading it. Thank you very much for that. Just we'll conclude the last line. Let's not forget, as our sages tell us, that the merit of righteous women we were redeemed from Egypt, and the merit of righteous women, our future redemption will come. What greater female power is there than that? The next essay is Making Your Grass Greener, Shmuel Wagner, age 25, Brooklyn, New York. This essay will address feelings of jealousy and consequent despondency, demonstrating how through using a fundamental concept in Hasidic teachings, called Seva Vimamala, one can apply a method of thinking to increase satisfaction and happiness in one's life. Okay, very good. Goes on with the challenge. The method one, it's only an illusion. The challenge of dealing with the jealousy and so on. Number two, look at the whole picture. Number three, this is your Mamala. Number four, well, then come abstract versus tangible, general versus personal and the practical application. Really interesting take from jealousy's point of view, from, from the perspective of jealousy and applying chassidus to this issue. Well done as well. Good. And finally, essay number three is Despair as Catalyst for Change. This is in Hebrew. Despair as Catalyst for Change by Shmuel Lepkevker, age 23, United States. He's a student in yeshiva. Okay, so obviously the topic, the title speaks for itself. Despair, Yush, is more than just atzvus, depression. 
and talks about how that affects a person in a very profound way and how it's seen historically the good and bad in, in it in the general picture of the, the evolution of the attitudes towards this issue its effect on us and ultimately what we can do to counter it and its, and its negative consequences and it gives a very practical at the end practical steps of how to deal with despair and actually turn it into a catalyst into a springboard for tra- great growth okay so with that we conclude we conclude this week's essay this week's episode of my life this applied episode 224 wishing everyone a very freilichen and a very compassionate chedesh el and we will be here next sunday which will be the second day of the chedesh el the end of the day and uh, as we are every every sunday evening 8 to 9 p.m please submit your questions your comments feedback everything goes and i also encourage you to please help support this program and all the work that goes into it by going to MeaningfulLife.com slash sponsorship, dedicating a class, a program, a series of programs to a loved one or memory to a loved one, which will help us continue growing and continue developing this program. Thank you very much, everyone, and everyone have a blessed week.